Your Excellency and ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to uh, welcome you to today's seminar. Uh, we think we have more than well over 100 people that are interested in finding the IT partner code, which can, which can let uh, professionals uh, in Lithuania find uh, the IT market in Norway. Um, I'm very glad to introduce to uh, uh, welcome us to this seminar. Uh, the uh, ambassador uh, from Lithuania to Norway, His Excellency Jonas Paslauskas. Thank you, Diasen. Thank you very much. Hello to everyone. Hello to all of you. And I, at the very beginning, I already want to congratulate you with this big number of participants, more than 100. It's very good that, that, that the interest is here. Uh, this year we we uh, commemorate the 30th anniversary of of re-establishing diplomatic relations between uh, Norway and Lithuania. And during those 30 years, we we put a good basis for our cooperation. We have an exchange of the highest level visits from Lithuania to Norway and from Norway to Lithuania. The last example was the visit of uh, Norwegian Prime Minister uh, to Lithuania last uh, September. Uh, we have good cooperation between embassies. Uh, we have uh, cooperation and common events between two chambers of commerce in Vilnius and in uh, Oslo. Uh, and also definitely we have a quite good and intensive and dynamic cooperation between businesses. Uh, the network we created during those uh, 30 years, I think, is very reliable. And the last example is that, that during the 2020, that is the COVID year, we, we still managed to increase our trade between uh, Norway and Lithuania. Lithuanians in to increase exports by 12% and Norwegians increased the exports to Lithuania uh, by 10%. Uh, we also have a good stories, more than 40 good projects of investments in Lithuania from Norway. And Norway is now at present moment is number nine I think, as an investor. Uh, there are about uh, 300 Norwegian companies operating in, in Lithuania and which created about 12,000 of job places. Definitely the, the, our relations and our cooperation in the traditional fields as oil and gas or constructions or fisheries, they are very important and they, 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 uh, they are the, the biggest uh, part of our trade, but still, however, however in the area of um, digital economy, I think the information and communication technologies industry is becoming increasingly key important uh, to all of us. And we live now in an era of tech. Where we usually use those expressions like uh, like GovTech, MedTech, EdTech, HighTech, and so on and so on. So, um, and, and uh, having this opportunity, I, I would like to, to, to make some, some, to give some facts to you, uh, made some statements, uh, which I, I think will be disclosed more in the detail during your, your discussion during this event. Uh, I must say that, that uh, Lithuania has the largest ICT industry in the Baltic states. Uh, we have sky highly skilled and educated IT specialists. Uh, also, I would like to mention advanced IT infrastructure. Uh, also, excellent business environment and we have uh, governmental support and favor favorable regulatory base. Uh, and there are highly experienced Lithuanian companies in outsourcing services also. And uh, that's why we, we, we see that, that we having all this base, we still have a lot of potential in uh, our cooperation in IT uh, industry and in the IT business. So that's why we decided uh, together with the, the 
cooperation with the Chambers of Commerce uh, Enterprise Lithuania, we decided to hold a series of, of events to more proactively uh, work on our mutual uh, cooperation in this field. And it's my pleasure to, to thank once more to the moderator of this event, to Mr. Stein, uh, also to the speakers, to Pierre, to Espen, to Kastutis, Alexander, Tour, Darius, and uh, I wish you most valuable and productive discussions. And thank you very much for the interest and for the participating in such events. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ambassador. Uh, it's nice to hear that uh, trade is already blossoming between um, the two countries. Before you continue, just uh, some practical information. Uh, and I'm glad to say it isn't about fire exit and so forth that you need to know depending on uh, where you sit, but it is more how you communicate and raise questions. At the bottom of your screen, you will find a button saying chat. You can click on that and on the right hand side, you can place questions that we will be answering towards the end of the session today in about an hour's time. Um, I also want to thank Enterprise Lithuania and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in uh, Lithuania, represented by the Lithuanian Embassy in Oslo, Norwegian Lithuanian Chamber of Commerce and the Lithuanian Norwegian Chamber of Commerce for putting the program together to what looks like it could be a very exciting day. Uh, to see the potential, uh, the next uh, item on the list is bilateral economic trade in services, a brief overview by Darius Budris, who is the Lithuanian commercial attaché in Norway. Darius, over to you. Good day to everyone. Can you hear me well? Um, we can. So I'll try to show my slides. Good. So during my very brief uh, presentation, I will try to touch two aspects. Uh, where we stand with our bilateral uh, trade with particular emphasis on ICT and uh, why we should substantially strengthen our uh, ICT export. So uh, the bilateral trade volume between uh, Norway and Lithuania has been uh, increasing for a number of years. And as ambassador has rightly indicated, uh, the trend haven't changed uh, even uh, during COVID-19. And Lithuania was uh, among those small number of countries that had has had a positive um, trade turnover for 2020. Uh, however, uh, if we take a look at the structure of the uh, uh, trade, we'll see that uh, uh, the line here is uh, taken by uh, such sectors like oil and gas, as well as um, uh, construction related uh, uh, trade. So uh, basically it's traditional sectors, but hey, we are living in, in a digital era. And in digital era, when all the uh, businesses are competing in order to stay competitive and try to digitalize uh, information and co communication technology industry becomes even more important. So where we stand here, and uh, this chart depict, uh, these charts depicts the uh, the ICT uh, services percentage of ICT services in our trade. So six percent in both cases. Is it enough? Well, difficult to say, we should dig a little bit deeper. Um, uh, there has been, a, as you can see, there has been a constant um, increase in ICT services export for both countries. And it seems that the trend uh, remains the same in 2020. Is it greater or sufficient? I, I would say rather not because other se uh, sectors were increasing even higher. Uh, however, the whole picture becomes even uh, more problematic when we compare uh, the, um, uh, the uh, trade in ICT services with the whole trade. So in, for example, in 2019, our trade with Norway ha has reached point, uh, 1.8 billion euros, which is, which is really substantial. But at the same time, our trade in ICT services has been 
uh, 30, uh, was uh, 36 million euros. So only 2% of all trade is definitely not enough. So here we come to the question why, uh, why we should devote more efforts uh, to, to, to have the larger ICT expert in Nova. Uh, and um, let me look to it from the Finland perspective. So first, uh, it is uh, still untapped potential. Norway imports ICT uh, services for an amount that reach 3.3 uh, billion euros. At the same time, our export to Norway is 23.7 million euros. So there is really huge potential here. And uh, I would like to uh, draw your attention that here we are not uh, competing with Norwegian companies. Here we are competing with the rest of the world in order to become partners with Norwegian companies. And this is what we do with uh, in, in other uh, continents. Uh, uh, and this is what we do in other countries, in other markets, in US, United Kingdom and Ireland, uh, neighboring Sweden. And uh, we know how to deliver and how, how to do it su successfully. And uh, we were trusted by such uh, global and regional companies like Nasdaq, Uber, uh, Visma, Thea, and many others. Just to, to shortly say, uh, Nasdaq office in Vilnius is the second largest uh, office in Europe and the third largest uh, in, in, uh, globally. So it, it has to work without uh, any interruptions 24 seven. And that is uh, uh, supported by 300 Lithuanian IT specialists. Uber is taking care of 50% of its core infrastructure by providing IT uh, development services at their uh, Vilnius office. So this is our why, and it is logical to jump to the next question, how? But I believe it is uh, one of the topics of our today event. So this is why I stop. So stay tuned, absorb the information that will be delivered by other speakers. Uh, be bold, be proactive, challenge us, embassy, challenge our partners, both chambers of commerce. And I believe that with your determination and our support, we'll definitely, you will definitely su succeed in Norway. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Darius. There looks to be a huge untapped potential in this sector. And um, that is, of course, why we have this webinar today. The next on the agenda is Offshoring 2.0, the way to, to business in Norway by Per Mortenhoff, who is the former Secretary General of IC2 in Norway, which he was for 27 years. He's also an old foe from the running track, who is also a great friend. So I'm very glad to welcome you, Per Morten, to give this speech. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Stan Ove. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to give you a short brief uh, about the situation in Norway. And uh, I have called uh, my little pep talk, Offshoring 2.0. And the reason for 2.0 is that a lot has changed during the last years when it comes to, uh, to offshoring, not at least uh, in the Norwegian uh, market. Uh, just to, to start with some, uh, some facts. Um, Norway has still a great lack of skilled IT workers. And uh, this is good news for, uh, not good news for Norway, but perhaps good news for Lithuanian IT uh, companies. Um, actually, the, the employment within the, I, the ICT sector uh, in Norway has grown with uh, 25% during the last 10 years. So it has been 25% growth during the last 10 years, but still we have a great lack of skilled uh, workers. And um, within 2030, uh, the growth is anticipated to grow um, for about 66%. So it's a really a booming uh, industry. And uh, today it's more than 2000 jobs, which is not possessed. And of course, this is serious because projects get slower uh, and there are a lot of, uh, of uh, difficulties to find skilled people. Um, it's also um, pretty recently made a report uh, from um, 
uh, Institute that said that uh, within 2030, uh, we will need more uh, than 40,000 new employees uh, within the ICT sector in Norway. Um, uh, yeah, I started um, uh, this little speech to say that offshoring has changed uh, and uh, to try to give some advice to uh, to the Lithuanian companies. So I find it that there is no good idea to send uh, out hundreds of mails or LinkedIn uh, uh, posts uh, that we can help you from Lithuania. Uh, it's a huge overload of that kind of, uh, of messages from actually all over the, over the world, from India, from Sri Lanka, from Belarus, from Romania, uh, um, yeah, all over. Uh, and what we see in Norway is that uh, the, the new deal, the 2.0, is that uh, Norwegian companies are looking more for long, long uh, time um, uh, cooperation. Um, I feel that the shop and drop uh, period more or less uh, has stopped. Uh, another new factor is uh, the Norwegian in um, IT companies are looking for senior experience, not juniors. And CVs is extremely important in the um, uh, IT market in, uh, in Norway today. So skilled IT people with the experience and who can lead teams are really number one. Uh, so, so what I said, shopping to find the cheapest IT people are no longer the case. Uh, perhaps with the expectation, um, with the exception of some startup companies who really have uh, good ideas, but not so much money. Uh, we also um, see a new trend, uh, and I'm a bit skeptical uh, on that. And that's that's come actually from the public sector. Public sector stands for. 50% uh, of the total revenue of the IT companies in, uh, in Norway. Um, and uh, public sector, they now only want senior people. Uh, uh, junior people are more or less uh, of no interest. Uh, of course, th that makes it a problem that uh, it's difficult for... Uh, for junior peoples coming right out from the universities uh, to get into good um, uh, projects and to get uh, experience. Um, we also see um, a, a, a pretty new way, and that is how the teams are set up. If, if we go uh, perhaps only five, six years back or, or even less than that, uh, if it was a big uh, public project, and of course a tender, perhaps Accenture uh, won the tender. Uh, so they set it up, uh, the whole team. Now it's more to mix, to set up teams. So perhaps there will be uh, uh, 10 people from uh, Bouvet, uh, 10 people from uh, Suprasteria, five people from uh, Accenture, one from Microsoft, etc. So they are mixing team, which is pretty new actually in, uh, in, in Norway, and also makes the, the market a bit more complicated. Uh, so, so it's more or less about CV shopping. And uh, it's coming up some companies uh, who really uh, are experts in, in setting up teams. And we see it's much more cooperation between uh, companies who earlier were fighting for um, for um, uh, every every tender, um, and uh, yeah, what kind of IT uh, people are uh, is needed in Norway? Uh, it's a great lack of senior IT architects. That's actually number one. Uh, we also see that it's a great lack of uh, cloud uh, experienced people. Uh, security is another aspect. Uh, security it becomes more and more important. 
this is perhaps a bit more difficult uh, for uh, foreign uh, companies uh, because in uh, yeah some public project even some private uh, project you will need a security clearance um, but security uh, becomes more and more uh, important and also when it comes to network specialists uh, within uh, Cisco technology, etc., it's a great lack of uh, of skilled people. Even with more, uh, yeah, simple solutions like .NET, etc., we have a still lack of uh, of skilled people. So I'll try to give you some uh, advices at uh, at the end of my my short speech. Um, number one, it's needed to have a long-term perspective. It takes time and uh, uh, Norway has actually been a slow mover when it comes to, to offshoring. They need to find that it's secure, it's safe. Um, so start with a small project and uh, try to build it into, into bigger projects. Uh, if you are a small innovative uh, company in Lithuania, uh, perhaps it would be a good idea to set up a cooperation with um, Norwegian startups. It's a lot of them. And uh, I think they're my best advice is to try to, to visit incubators like Startup Lab in Oslo uh, and, uh, and other big uh, incubators. Because um, I think it's more important to, to see each other than just to receive an email that we can, we can help you. And uh, third, uh, it's so important to build up a CV database and uh, also cooperate with other companies to try to set up also teams from your side, which can fit into Norwegian teams. This is really, uh, really important. And uh, it's coming up some, some uh, companies who are trying to to mix and set up this, uh, these teams like uh, ProData Consulting and uh, Fornabu Consulting, uh, companies uh, who, re who really good, uh, have good experience to set up teams on behalf of other companies. Uh, I said that price was not longer than number one, but uh, perhaps to give you um, a small um, view, uh, what are the prices in, in Norway? Of course, it's... Um, uh, this is very not very exactly, but a junior IT uh, consultants um, can bill uh, 70 to 80 euros per hour. A senior IT consultants between 90 and 160 euros per hour. A senior advice architect, also pretty senior level. Uh, between 200 and uh, 300 uh, euros per, uh, per, per hour. So actually, I think it's good possibilities to have cooperation between Lithuanian IT companies and the Norwegian IT industry. Uh, but you need to be patient and you need to find contacts um, and, and start with some small projects uh, to know that... Um, and secure them that uh, we could cooperate in, uh, in a good way. So I'm optimistic. Uh, I think there will be uh, great possibilities uh, if we do it uh, the right way. But just to send out mails and to uh, use LinkedIn, it's no longer the way to, uh, to do it. So I think I will finish with that and I could take some questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Per Morten. That was interesting to hear to you Lithuanians listening, be aware that the price levels on consultancy is gross values that should also cover insurances and taxes and all that. So it's not the net uh, pay that you are used to on salary levels in Lithuania. Um, the next one uh, will be experience from nearshoring and offshoring in Kongsberg by Espen Vöyen, who is the senior vice president at software development at Kong Kongsberg Digital. Over to you, Espen. Thank you, David. Uh, thanks for being invited uh, to this event. Um, 
Very interesting also to hear uh, from Per Morten, I think, when he described the situation in Norway now, uh, it's a really lack of skilled IT professionals. Uh, it's a really battle out there. Uh, we are really fighting for talent and um, Kongsberg, we are hiring um, and we are succe successfully hiring in Norway, but um, it's, it's uh, really rough. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, as mentioned, uh, responsible for the software development in uh, Kongsberg Digital. Uh, I have been in Kongsberg for the last six years and um, also uh, the last uh, 10 before that in uh, DNV. And I work with uh, different kind of outsourcing and building up development centers uh, in a country like uh, China, India, Poland and Bulgaria. Uh, so um, I will tell a bit about that experience in general and uh, also focus more with uh, how we are doing this in, in Kongsberg in, in special. Okay, um, next slide please. Yeah, uh, just a brief uh, introduction to Kongsberg. Uh, you, most of you may have heard about it, uh, especially if you're interested in the no Norwegian industry. Uh, we have a quite long and unique history of more than 200 years of technology innovation. Uh, we like to say it's from deep sea to, to outer space. Uh, we have um, IOEs uh, going down to 6,000 uh, meters uh, at the seabed. We have uh, to kind of be very active in, in the aerospace or space industry. Um, so uh, we have an uh, organization across all of these sectors and, and more than that. Uh, next please. We are uh, headquartered in, uh, in Norway. Uh, in total we are around 11,000 employees. Uh, in 2019 we had a uh, revenue of 24 billion NOx um, and uh, have three different business uh, areas. Next. Yeah, uh, still uh, biggest in Norway, but uh, quite significant um, portion of, of my employees uh, around the world with uh, 40, more than 40 um, offices uh, around. Next. Yeah, and uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, we have three business areas. Uh, we are a quite diverse company. Um, all the business areas deliver excellence in the respective market. And for us, it's extremely important to provide number one product in our niche. And uh, several of our state-of-the-art solutions um, are a result of cross-company efforts and achievement. We see that uh, we reuse technology ideas from, for example, Kongsberg Maritime into Kongsberg De Defense and vice versa. Um, Kongsberg Maritime is the biggest business unit in in um, business area. Sorry, in in Kongsberg, around seven thousand employees, and uh, they are working towards, of course, the maritime uh, segment. And actually, in Kongsberg, more than eighty percent of our um, activities can be linked back to the uh, to the ocean. Uh, Kongsberg Defense and Air System is uh, around three and a half thousand employees, uh, delivering uh, a lot of uh, um, modern uh, technology to the defense areas there, but also to the civilians. It's around 50-50 there. And then um, Cosper Digital. Uh, we are actually the digital spearhouse of, um, of uh, Kongsberg. We were established in 2016 um, to help out to, to digitalize Kongsberg and digitalize our products. And we are on a very, very exciting journey, I will say on that. Uh, we are working mainly with Kongsberg Marita now in, in the Kongsberg um, group uh, and helping out to digitalize uh, software or the operation uh, in the maritime and ocean area. So, um, yeah, next uh, please. Uh, and one more click, please. Um, Kongsberg Digital, I would just want to spend a bit of time, a little time on that one. Uh, we are delivering software products. We are a soft, pure software company. 
we're delivering products, not uh, projects. Uh, we have a nice variety of established products uh, in the energy ocean and digital wells industry. Uh, now we are uh, we have had two huge in its new in, uh, investments, targeting the dynamic digital twin and uh, uh, targeting maritime ecosystem. So uh, in what we call a uh, digital twin, we are uh, delivering a product called Cognitive Twin. It's 100% SaaS uh, based on, uh, on uh, Microsoft Azure. All new developments are cloud-based. Uh, we are delivering the ecosystem, the infrastructure, and providing applications uh, together with partners on top of that. Same in the maritime digital solution space, we are delivering a product uh, portfolio called Vessel Insight, where we actually connect the vessels around the, the, um, uh, the world uh, and gather data from the operation. And here we are in a very special situation, uh, uh, cooperating very well with Kongsberg Maritime, which has installed equipment in more than 30,000 of the vessels all around the world. So uh, our aim is to be a number one uh, digital maritime ecosystem, create that one, partnership that will Kongsberg, uh, create that infrastructure, that ecosystem, and uh, get other partners also to develop applications on top of that. So we are on the way uh, on that way. Um, we have a quite uh, distributed set of development. We are uh, having distributed the global teams, uh, kind of not all around the world, but uh, several places around the world. So if you take the next one. Yeah, uh, digging into software development in Corsco Digital, we are around 300 or a bit more than 300 uh, developers now. Um, but we are really dependent on consultants and also outsourcing activities. We deliver into energy, ocean and wells industry. We have our head office in Asker, close to Oslo. Uh, we have a dev center in Bangalore. I will come a bit more back to that. Uh, and also doing development out of Horten, Kristiansand, Trondheim and, and Houston. So what's special with the uh, Digital? Well, we are delivering really advanced software and services. We are delivering software uh, support, kind of the industries Kongsberg uh, are working in. Uh, we are delivering um, everything new on the cloud. Azure is uh, our preferred platform. We have a long history of doing physical simulations uh, use, or simulate, uh, simulations using physical laws to say it that way. Uh, during the last years, we have built up a significant uh, unit of sexual center excellence for machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. So we think we are really strong when we kind of combine these two. And we are also known to be quite good at or very good to visualize, 3D visualize typically uh, a lot of data. So our systems are typically connected to IoT systems. We are transporting a lot of real-time data, uh, we are working with the data, we are able to predict the state in the future and so on. And next please. So a bit more into the core, I think. Um, what are we doing outside Norway? Well, I would say we don't do offshoring uh, in the traditional way of doing offshoring. Uh, we have done it before, uh, but uh, we are kind of, I will come back to that, taken what we have done offshore and uh, bring it into the company. Uh, so we don't do offshoring, but we have dev center in Bangalore and Mumbai, quite huge. We have also dev center in Poland. Uh, we do uh, nearshoring in Europe. Uh, we have several uh, in several countries, but uh, mainly actually Bulgaria. You can maybe argue it's not so close to Norway, but uh, it's at least in Europe and in the uh, European Union, so which is uh, quite important for, for Kongsberg actually. Uh, we also use several smaller consultancy companies um, because we need to get uh, this competence we hardly get in Norway. As uh, Per Morten also said, it's really hard to get the competence in Norway. 
and that's why we need to go out to Nova. And we have done that for uh, for 20 years or more in Kongsberg. And uh, another thing, we are working long term with our suppliers, or uh, I prefer to call them partners, because we need to work like a partners if this is going to succeed. Uh, we don't outsource. We don't uh, go for outsourcing for cost. We go for competence, and we go for scalability. And we, we are looking, of course, to the areas where they have access to talent. Access to talent also have a counterpart, of course, and this means that uh, there is a fight for talent. But uh, we have, uh, I will say, we kind of uh, succeed very well in that area. A third point which uh, we should not underestimate is we are also using um, partners to increase our innovation. That's extremely important. And especially for Kongsberg, who is so dependent on innovation, it's extremely important that we also use this uh, opportunity with outsourcing partner to do innovation together. One for minute, example, that's yeah, that's good. Uh, and then when it's come to outsourcing, uh, I really believe it's about trust. It's about transparency, good cooperation, communication, and of course, a uh, tight relationship. And doing that, we can have a success, a successful partnership. Next. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, we insourced across for digital. We acquired that in 2012. We have used them as an offshoring partner. It just doesn't work so well um, uh, when we had them as an offshoring partner. Uh, what we did when we outsourced, especially from 2016, uh, we gave much more ownership. We stopped doing micromanagement. We gave more trust. Uh, and they build a relationship. So now it's a successful, um, a successful part of the company. Next, yeah, just to, just to show why it's important um, the ability to scale. Uh, we had a kind of fresh recruitment in in Bangalore. We do that every year, and we get twelve thousand applicant applications, uh, five rounds uh, of interviews. Uh, and 15 people were uh, offering the jobs. That's a kind of, then they have access to a lot of talents. Uh, next. Yeah, uh, how do we select partners? Well, uh, don't, I don't need to repeat, but competence is number one, of course. Culture is important, stability, cost, also domain knowledge, distance, uh, and, and so on, but also relationship, like do we have any relationship to this country, to the company and so on. Next. And then I think, uh, as I mentioned, uh, partnership, we need to look at this as partnership. We don't, we can't only look at this as a supplier vendor uh, relationship. It's, it's more than that. Uh, and we see we succeed when we do events together, we do hackathon, social gathering, we utilize each other's innovation lab and so on. So I think that's uh, that's uh, very important for us, and uh, that's how we see we can succeed. So I think that's uh, end my presentation, and I'm happy to answer some questions afterwards if there are someone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Espen. I must say as a Norwegian that uh, whenever I look at presentation of what the Kongsberg Group is, uh, is achieving, it uh, makes me proud. I'm also very proud of what I see that uh, the Lithuanian teams I'm working with here in, in Vilnius uh, represent quality and I'm absolutely sure that Lithuania and uh, Norwegian teams can be even stronger together. Uh, to hear more about how it is doing uh, IT consulting in Norway, from an IT consultant's perspective, we have uh, Kestutis Tomkevicius, who works at Bove in uh, Oslo. Uh, so over to you, Kestutis. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, so then I'll share my screen. Uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, all right. So, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I want to kick off uh, this uh, 
my presentation with a question. So what is an IT consultant in Lithuania and what do they do? Uh, and I have a few uh, screenshots uh, from uh, the Google search um, with this uh, uh, keyword in the slide topic, IT consultant in Lithuanian. And I'm starting this uh, because um, I have a feeling that a consultancy in, uh, or IT consultant uh, and IT consultancy in Lithuania is understood a bit differently uh, uh, than here in Nordics. And then for those of you uh, not speaking Lithuanian, so that was your uh, Lithuanian language lesson for today. Uh, IT consultants, remember that. Uh, and then since we are talking about uh, the consultancy, uh, uh, one of the goals um, uh, I want to talk about is that um, uh, I want to share my uh, perspective, how I perceive the differences of uh, uh, that concept of consultancy in those of two, in, in my two countries, Norway and Lithuania. And I also uh, looking forward uh, to give you some new ideas and probably better understanding of Norwegian IT market. Uh, and I uh, would be glad to actually see more uh, Nor Lithuanian companies working in Norway and presenting our country uh, from that uh, brand minded technology uh, mastering people uh, side, not only builders or truck drivers. So a bit about me. Uh, my name is Kastutis Sankiewicz uh, and uh, I'm working for Buve as an IT consultant. And uh, this year is my 10th year in this company. Uh, I'm currently deliver delivering in two roles uh, as a consultant as, and as a project manager. Uh, and uh, in my daily work day, I'm wearing two different uh, other hats, uh, team lead, architect, but sometimes I do development and QA. And uh, most of my career, um, uh, I've been working as application or system integration uh, developer and consultant. Uh, and then uh, in those 10 years here in Norway, uh, I spent uh, time in oil and gas, uh, utilities, transportation companies, um, and also had a few customers in the public services, such as Norwegian municipalities. So I know uh, both private and, uh, and public companies a bit. So in the next uh, eight, 10 minutes, I'm gonna, covering, uh, I'm gonna be covering all those topics here. Uh, but just a disclaimer, I'm delivering this presentation from my personal perspective and uh, therefore everything what's in this presentation is my own understanding of the situation in Norway. And it's uh, not in any case related to my employer or, or its perspective. So very briefly about Bouvier. Uh, Bouvier is, uh, the company is named uh, after an island in the South Atlantic Ocean uh, with harsh environments where we need to, where you need to be very adaptable and tough to live there. Uh, and that's what we're doing here in IT market in Norway. We try to fight and survive in this, uh, as was uh, correctly mentioned, the, the talent uh, hiring and headhunting and also fighting for, uh, in the market for, for sales. Um, the company is leading a Scandinavian consultancy company, providing services in the fields of technology, communication, and enterprise management. Uh, and the company is quite important in the Norwegian economy. It's listed in Oslo Stock Exchange. Uh, as you saw, we have uh, uh, offices in, four, in 14 different uh, Scandinavian cities. And uh, later on in the presentation, I'll tell you why it's very important to Bouvet. Uh, and that's what we do. Uh, Bouvet is purely a consulting company and 99.999% of the income comes from the uh, consultancy activities. And we're also partners with Microsoft and a few other local and global vendors. Uh, and in the recent years, we're actually looking very much into VR, AR solutions. Uh, okay, so now to the main part of the presentation. <clears throat> uh, when it comes to consulting versus outsourcing, uh, uh, the previous uh, speaker has already touched a bit uh, on what's outsourcing and uh, the the groups uh, of the or the, the the levels of the outsourcing. Uh, but uh, I want to continue on that topic uh, from two of the uh, Gartner's uh, definitions, and to me they look very similar. I mean, outsourcing consulting it's more or less the same uh, probably, uh, but I found a better uh, definition unofficial one, which in my mind describes what we're doing as consultants and what is the outsourcing. 
So yeah, and, and when it comes to IT consulting here in Norway, from my perspective, I think that uh, domestic outsourcing and consulting are very closely intertwined. Uh, and uh, sometimes we, uh, as consultants, we don't even uh, think twice, uh, and we do and do and we do both of those in our daily works. So a bit about consultancy and why it's not purely development or outsourcing. Um, so mainly the uh, what what I see the differences are type of work we're delivering uh, and the, the work standard, uh, but also nevertheless. Uh, uh, team size is also important, uh, and I really saw the teams uh, of less than five people from the same company at the customer, and those five people or more of them uh, are actually coming from different uh, uh, functional layers. So they can be analysts, they can be project managers, developers, QA, uh, and so on and so on. And then projects are at least three months, uh, and sometimes you get uh, even longer term projects, uh, like four to six years with some extensions. Uh, and my personal experience is that my first project was actually four years at the customer's location, and then I had the one year of phasing out or transitioning to different projects. Uh, so work of type you're doing, you're not only developing, uh, you actually, first and foremost, you come in as advisory uh, with advisory services, and you implement based on those advices you gave to the customer. So you advise, uh, you, you, uh, you estimate, uh, you assess his perspective and his needs, and then you find the solution uh, and you provide that solution. So it's it's not really only development or operations or support or call center. Um, and work standard as well is very important. Um, I would say we as consultants, we are more the same to the customer as his own employees. Uh, we are not expected to overwork uh, and uh, actually extra hours are often very strictly prohibited or you, you're limited to no more than like 20 hours a week extra. And then uh, one more very important thing is that uh, before COVID times, we had those shared social events with a customer. So you're actually invited into, into his events. You, you are part of the team. Uh, and then again, being close to customer, you always work uh, uh, close to him as one team. And here we come to that uh, uh, new term, uh, which is getting very popular in Norway. Uh, one team, uh, meaning that hired employees and consultants are working together closely um, and doing and delivering the same the same functionality, the same functions uh, in, in daily life. Probably only top management is uh, left for the hired employees, but architecture analysis, development databases, uh, cloud security, uh, those coming from both hired employees and developers. And I could even guesstimate that uh, based on my last couple of years experience, um, I can say that, uh, Hired employees and consultants in the company are actually shared by 50-50 ratio, sometimes even more consultants than hired employees. So that definitely ties very well into what the previous speakers were, were saying that it's the high uh, comp uh, high competition and the and the lack of skills and the, and the resources. And we do have the same in, in Bouvet as well. Uh, we go in the external markets and trying to find good good competence. So what are the needs in Norway? Um, uh, per Morten has uh, touched very well on that one, uh, cybersecurity, cloud solutions. And I can say that in, especially since uh, 2019, digitalization was one of the main keywords in, in, IT Nor uh, in Norway, in IT market. Um, and yeah, uh, and, but, but the rest of them are also not, uh, not forgotten. So, so all of those are needed. Uh, it's just uh, some of them are more prioritized. And by the way, Norway is a fantastic country. So the ones uh, who haven't been here, um, please come. Uh, I invite you because this rock is just uh, 40 minutes drive from my country, from from where I live, from where I live, and then sit now. So we could go there together. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I have a bit on market uh, cap, uh, but I want to just briefly go that through that. Uh, market is looking healthy. Uh, market is uh, going upwards, and uh, even. Uh, COVID times uh, didn't stop it. Uh, so in, uh, in this chart, you see that uh, IT consultancy is in the blue and uh, um, in red, you have uh, support and maintenance and gray is development. So development is actually one of the smallest part in, 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 in these services. And then you have one on top, which is dark blue, which is uh, all the rest of the IT services. 
uh, but that's Nordics. And then again, I said uh, uh, the market probably fell down a bit, uh, but it's it's still looking good. Uh, and uh, 2020 was very exceptional year. It was COVID, and it was uh, oil uh, crisis or oil wars in Middle East uh, with Russia. So so we uh, yeah uh, that definitely affected it. We still have some time, Kestrutis, but can you manage in one to two more minutes? I'll try. Yeah. Uh, the market is huge. Uh, the comp uh, competence uh, is huge, but uh, also you have a lot of employees in, uh, or a lot of uh, players in that market. So some of those names are already known to people in Fenia, and some of them are very global. Uh, and uh, some of them, like Bouvet or Webstep, uh, Kriuna, are local players. So how to enter the market uh, from uh, for the new company i've probably uh, would say that there are some databases and websi uh, websites where you can find the, the sales uh, opportunities uh, some of them are in norwegian some of them in english uh, like this one uh, you have it consultancy it support uh, and you have also it support on the end uh, the next one is very much similar one just more in norwegian than in english and then I had the uh, one more, which uh, requires uh, having the company registered in Norway uh, to even sign up. Uh, but I would probably encourage to, instead of going that way, to look for the partners in uh, in the market, already established partners. That's probably going to be easier way uh, to find. And then I know that the process is going to be covered in the next presentation by Mr. Alexander, uh, especially in the public sector, uh, but at least in oil and gas, uh, this um, RFI, RFP, RFQ process being followed in, in terms of purchasing uh, of the services. And I know that from my own experience, I've been delivering uh, a few, or I was contributing by delivering those uh, uh, documents for RFI and RFP stages uh, myself with the team. So, so yeah, I know it's being followed. And then very briefly, uh, one of the last slides, um, requirements for vendors. Um, it was very well mentioned by, uh, uh, by previous speaker that you have some qualities uh, they're looking for. And same goes for, vendor, uh, for, the custom, uh, for the customers or the companies who are hiring consultants. Uh, they're looking for very specific qualities uh, in my mind. And uh, remember when I when I spoke that uh, Bouvet has 14 local offices in big biggest cities in Norway and Sweden, and uh, that we are very close to customer local partners. So that's uh, I think that's uh, being local player is uh, one of the success uh, factors in 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 Bouvet. And other than that is uh, uh, since we are a Norwegian company, uh, Bouvet has similar working culture as most of our customers. We share similar values, speak the same language. So that's that's another point what helps. Uh, and also, I think being known to customer, having delivered few successful small contracts or projects, having that good name, having the history of being the consultants, experienced consultants, um, uh, having the pool of uh, good resources. And uh, that definitely helps building that bond between two partners, customer and the IT consulting company. And I guess it's it's nothing uh, very shocking. It's a common sense, but I was uh, still uh, willing to to share that with you. And also, language is important, as you saw in the previous slides. You need to uh, to have some Norwegian uh, uh, to to at least participate in that bidding process. So my key takeaways um, are these. Uh, I'm not spending more time. Uh, I will over the time. Uh, so. Uh, I hope you found it interesting and useful and didn't fall asleep. So thank you very much. Or as in Lithuania, we say, Acho. Acho Kestutis, very well done. Uh, nice insight. And uh, thanks for that. Uh, we will uh, run on to the next one, um, which is about Norwegian public procurement in IT by Alexander van der Velde. He's a partner at Inventura, who is a specialist in public uh, procurement. Alexander, it's your turn. Hello, Lithuania. Good morning. Um, can you all hear me now? Can you see the screen? You can see the screen and you either have to share your presentation or your video or both.
I see you, but not the presentation yet. Here is the presentation. Good. So, good morning, uh, Lithuania. Um, yes, I've been asked to do a short presentation about the, um, uh, especially the public procurement market for uh, ICT in Norway. Um, first, a little bit about myself. If you um, if you look up my name, you're probably wondering why I'm uh, <laughs> I'm von der Felde. It's a Dutch name. I'm probably the only one in this uh, event that is neither Lithuanian or Norwegian. Uh, but I've lived in Norway the last 24 years. Uh, I've also learned cross-country skiing, so that probably goes for half a Norwegian at least. Um, I am a managing partner in Inventura in Oslo, and we are a consultancy company uh, that are uh, helping both public and private companies and institutions in, uh, in procuring uh, all kinds of things, uh, but mainly ICT services. Um, so, uh, first of all, some key characteristics uh, about the Norwegian market. Some of them have been covered already by the previous speakers. Uh, the market for ICT procurement is relatively mature and developed in Norway, probably as most of the nor uh, northern European uh, countries. It is well regulated uh, and it's, uh, it's structured. Um, the public market, actually, the total expenditure in Norway for goods and services, which is not only IT, but everything together, is about 46 uh, to 50 billion euros. Uh, that's uh, numbers from 2019. Uh, so it's a huge market to be tapped upon. The Norwegian government, the Norwegian state and institutions, municipalities, they rely on, uh, on private uh, companies to, uh, to fulfill their needs. So this is uh, uh, a huge uh, opportunity for, uh, for foreign companies as well. Uh, there is a big focus on digitalization in, in Norway in general uh, from the government. Uh, in uh, last year only, uh, there was a newly uh, created uh, directorate which is called uh, DIGDIR. It's uh, got a huge focus on digitalization in, in the public sector and the government. Um, another characteristic of the, the Norwegian market is that there are often used uh, state uh, standard contracts. So there is a particular set of uh, contract standards, uh, which is actually uh, downloadable online with the link that you see in the, in the slide. Uh, they're called SSA contracts and uh, not always, but often they are used so that means that it's a predict predictable uh, legal standard in, uh, in ICT procurement. Innovation, as also said by previous speakers, is uh, both desired uh, and encouraged. There are actually special procedures for uh, innovation uh, projects in uh, public procurement, which uh, may look complicated and they probably could be, but it's uh, worthwhile uh, looking at those. And then again, I won't use a lot of time for this uh, last point because they've been taken up uh, actually in the last three presentations. Uh, from a buyer's perspective, uh, there can be shortages. Uh, it's, it's hard to get the best resources. And this translate, uh, translates actually uh, from our point of view, if we have com competitions or tenders, uh, that it could actually be that we have uh, zero uh, offers or zero bids because uh, either uh, the value is too low, or uh, there are other uh, more profitable projects uh, that the consultants can be used for. Which again can be uh, an opportunity for, uh, for outsiders. A little bit of, about the pros and cons of the public market, uh, as opposed to the private market. As uh, Per Motten already said, with emails and LinkedIn and contacts, uh, if you are aiming for a private market, uh, everybody probably knows that it's important to have contacts and networks. Uh, it doesn't mean that you don't need those in public procurement, uh, but uh, fortunately, uh, there are uh, European procurement laws and regulations, which also are valid in Norway. Even though Norway is not part of the European Union, we have the same uh, European procurement uh, regulations, uh, as probably in Lithuania as well, with some small deviations. Um, the first advantage of uh, the, the public market is it provides usually uh, a safe and stable client base. Uh, you get your money, uh, they pay, and there is a good possibility for uh, framework agreements or long-term contracts, especially in ICT, uh, that normally have an, a service uh, maintenance component as well, or cloud services. Um, the second one is that the, uh, the public regulation actually creates a level playing field also for outsiders. So if you're a Lithuanian or any foreign company, 
uh, you are working on the same uh, base playing field as uh, Norwegian companies, theoretically. Uh, and that is good because uh, you will be uh, awarded contracts based on, uh, on uh, objective criteria. Uh, again, as I said in the previous slide, there is uh, the, the standard contracts are well balanced. They have been developed uh, in, uh, in cooperation between uh, buyers and suppliers in the ICT market. Uh, so they're really uh, legally well balanced. Uh, I will come back to it later, but what counts in, in public tenders are uh, objective and predictable award criteria. And you know this uh, in advance. If you look at the tender, you can actually see what the criteria are and also what the weighting is. For example, uh, well, a typical division between cost and quality, and those can be further specified. Uh, last uh, a con actually of a public market, uh, private projects can be um, time consuming. Uh, but the same can be said for uh, public uh, tenders. Some of them are really uh, complicated. They're uh, long, they have a long list of requirements, maybe even detailed, it's getting better, but still it can be uh, resource demanding and long processes. And this means that if you decide to enter the Norwegian market, which I would uh, really recommend you have a look at, uh, choose your projects and tenders carefully and targeted, and don't use a shotgun approach because that means you will get lost in the woods and you will not probably win anything. So uh, check, check the, uh, the tender, match them with your competence and your resources and, uh, and, um, and participate. Um, I've also been in my previous life before procurement, I've worked as, um, as a business development manager, uh, establishing greenfield uh, markets in Asia and, uh, and Europe. Uh, just a short reminder, uh, the raison d'etre is the reason of being in a new market, in this case Norway. Actually, it's, it's quite simple, you can talk uh, hours about it, but there are, <laughs> in, at least in, in public tenders, this is valid. You have a reason of being in the market if at least one of these criteria are in place. A, you have a completely new product or a new solution, which means that you're a single bidder, and then of course you, uh, you have a good reason of being there. or you have a better product, which means that the quality criteria will uh, make you win a tender, or you have a lower cost. So that means that you can actually have the uh, same quality uh, on, uh, as per Martin says on, on CVs or on, uh, on the uh, consultants or the services, but you have a lower cost. And if uh, the cost is weighed at 30%, uh, for example, of a tender and the quality of 70%, uh, you can still win uh, by having a slightly lower cost or a, a hugely lower cost. Uh, did some small research. I'm not sure if the uh, numbers are still correct. I think those are numbers from 2019. It also has been said before in this uh, event that there is a potential wage or a cost advantage for Lithuanian companies. And this, well, of course, it can be used in outsourcing projects, but it can also be used as a tactical instrument for uh, Lithuanian companies uh, entering into tenders in, uh, in the Norwegian public market. Um, the numbers in gray, uh, I think of the gross monthly income for IT consultants in 2019, I think it's uh, at least a factor uh, 50 or double uh, in, in Norway uh, compared to Lithuania. So you can use this uh, tactically in, uh, in tenders. A short slide about the barriers to entry. Uh, again, it's, uh, it also is not too good to be true. Uh, language, as said also by Kostutis before, it's unfortunately still a significant hindrance, in, uh, at least in public uh, tenders. It's not so much the, uh, the actual work that has to be done. I mean, coding or developing or system architecture, a lot of that can be done in English. But it's more, again, as Kostutis also pointed out, in the bid process, contracts, uh, tender processes. Unfortunately, many Clients of us uh, still have uh, Norwegian tender documents and a Google Translate won't help you uh, a lot. So you have to find a partner or a, or a law firm helping you to translate that and uh, really understand the, uh, the process. Again, legal issues, uh, Norwe uh, Norwegian contract knowledge uh, and tender procedures, uh, although they should be pretty similar in, uh, in all the European countries, they still have their slight uh, uh, differences. So you need to know them and a small errors can make you lose a contract or not lose a, con lose a tender. The third point is uh, proximity of suppliers and this is something actually that has uh, we have uh, noted that has become less during this uh, last uh, one and a half COVID uh, year. 
uh, to remote working, more people and more customers have been uh, become have become aware that remote working actually uh, works fine. But still, uh, it may be considered as a risk factor. So we noticed that many of our customers, public customers, they put a slight question mark if it's a uh, if it's a bidder from. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, Lithuania. It could be Germany or England or or, or the Netherlands. It's uh, it's not really a plus because uh, they really like to have them just around the corner. Um, <clears throat> some tips again from a buyer's perspective uh, to increase uh, your chances uh, to have success in the in the weekend public market. Again, know your strengths, uh, what are you good at, and pick your tenders wisely. Um, again, Per Morten also said join open ICT networks in Norway, uh, gain market knowledge just by participating and, and getting information, know what's hot uh, and, um, and what, what the needs are. Uh, if you really are serious about uh, participating in Norwegian tenders, you, uh, you need to use some time, at least put one or two resources to, uh, to understand the SSA contracts. They're available as well in English, at least uh, I think all or most of them are available in English and you can, you can just download them. Uh, the next point that has been mentioned several times, so uh, I won't use a lot of time, uh, you can team up with local uh, companies, um, but you can do that as well as a subcontractor. Uh, so that means that um, more and more tenders have a wide span of, uh, of a need. So we have, um, we have a problem, please uh, solve the problem. And that can be uh, everything from development, system architecture, uh, service support. Uh, Etc. Uh, and it is not always uh, the big companies that go for these tenders that have the complete range of services. So that means that you, uh, you can team up as a subcontractor uh, to get in and uh, get some Norwegian reference projects. One minute, Alexander. I'm almost ready. Thank you. Uh, this may also overcome language and proximity barriers, at least in the establishment phase. So you get a foothold in the Norwegian market. Last point. If you, again, if you're really serious about it, you have selected some uh, bits, get some local bit management. That's typically also uh, in Natura. We, uh, we are a procurement company, but we also deliver bit management to, uh, to help uh, to get the good offers to hatch your chances in uh, winning public tenders. That was all from uh, my side. Thank you for your attention. Back to Steinova. Thank you very much, Alexander. That was very interesting. And uh, it's kind of strange to hear that there is business waiting there that no one is taking. So that means that there are opportunities. So uh, look out for some of these resources and find the right partners to collaborate with. Uh, before we move on to the last presentation, I want to remind you of asking questions. Uh, so, uh, and also for the speakers, please don't leave right afterwards. I want to gather the speakers also. So that's just some practical information. And to finish the speaking off, we have um, business culture in Norway and Lithuania by Tor Alm. He is the honorary consul of Lithuania in Stavanger and he has uh, 15 odd years uh, in experience with uh, working and collaborating with Lithuanians and uh, have a business in Klaipeda and will no doubt introduce himself well. Welcome, uh, Tur. Thank you, Steinova and uh, Mr. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be brief about uh, some cultural impressions that I've collected over the years uh, in uh, if there are any differences between um, uh, Norway and Lithuania. Uh, my background is that I'm uh, owner and founder of a small company called Flinke Folk. We started in 2006. Our main uh, clients have been uh, the larger oil and gas companies. 2014, after hiring people from there, we set up our own company in Klaipeda. In the year after, we opened up a small office in the Gulf of Mexico in New Orleans because our biggest client is there. And um, today we are four in Stavanger, ten in Lithuania, two in New Orleans. Uh, and Klaipeda is doing all our development work. Very, very nice team down there. Sorry about that. <laughs> Norway 
and Lithuania are both small countries with regard to population. And this is a fact that unifies us, but it makes us dependent on strong alliances, uh, which we both share. Um, we have NATO, we have EU memberships, association membership, etc. We are in many ways in Europe looked upon as two of the same kind. Small population, interesting activities ongoing in the countries, and they listen to us from time to time. We have culturally had exchanges for more than a thousand years. Vikings sailed into the Baltic, they came to Klaipeda, they entered river, sailed away all the way up to Vilnius. So we have known and traded with each other for much more than a thousand years. And if we look at it today, our cultures are remarkably similar, but we have been influenced uh, because we're geographically a little bit apart and we've had some strong willed neighbors. We have have, we still have a border with, uh, with Russia up in Northern Norway and you have um, uh, the enclave from Russia also bordering yours. And we have to find a way to live with them and exist with them. Today we are independent, fiercely independent, many will say, and we celebrate this by taking care of it with historical events, etc. Remnants of these periods are still present in today's societies, uh, but both of us are getting global uh, faster and faster. Uh, borders disappear, cultural differences disappear, so we act and behave and react to the same signals from the world uh, as all of us do. So we're becoming more and more similar. Uh, our experience from history make us fiercely independent and protective in some areas. In Lithuania, they have this fantastic old language with a unique heritage. They have the uh, partisan war resistance, which was a fantastic effort from the people springing out from culture and a need for freedom. It is today respected all over the world and uh, books are written about it. In Norway, we have the Viking heritage where we belong. We also had a partisan war resistance. We have rejected EU membership twice. It's respected, not always understood, but it is respected. It is not surprising that from these two small populated nations, uh, we have a saying today because we have found a way to survive among all these great powerful nations where our ideas and where our views are looked at and listened to. We have first class diplomacy in Lithuania and in Norway. We have an influential saying in many parts of EU. We have positions in, new, in the United Nations and NATO and they have a present in both our daily life. We work and act together there. Uh, whatever small cultural differences there are, are washed away because we have a common aim. This fact that we are two small nations survived all this and have a place in today's global arena makes it easy for Lithuanian companies to come to Norway. Very easy, in fact. I want to show something. These are probably the one to the left, Edward Munch, world, uh, Norway's most famous painter or artist. And Thierry Olonis is actually uh, mostly famous for his wonderful symphonies. But I guess he's also one of the most famous ones from Lithuania. Below these pictures, you see two paintings. They are remarkably similar. They spring out of culture and the way we look at the world. And these guys were working in the late, early uh, 1900s. Look at that. 
it's remarkable. I want to mention one other things. We have many similarities. All they are not so obvious at first glance, they are there. We had the natural water resources in our dams that we developed into hydroelectric production, which came a very important part of the Norwegian society's development for the next 200 years. Lithuania has a vast resources in geothermal energy. They are yet to be developed to its full potential, but there are similarities here. And we can exchange use, and we can exchange technology and exchange people because our culture are so similar. Uh, imagine Lithuania as an energy independent provider of green energy, which is also of course very, very important for future development, placement of IT farms, of uh, cloud-based systems, it could be a large part for the IT sector. And I also would say that the energy sector is always looking for talent, innovation, new solutions and reduced cost. Always. Uh, the sector has great growth potential. You come from a system where you culturally have fantastic education. You today have good universities and it's a very well uh, proven ground for, for uh, recruiting new talent. Nearshoring in uh, Lithuania will be much easier than doing it in India, Vietnam, uh, Asian countries. These facts makes it easy for you to come here. And uh, I can say that in uh, Rugalan, where I live, uh, city of Stavanger, there are 5,000 Lithuanians. It's a lot of people. They have put their imprint on our area. There are Lithuanian shops. There are non-Lithuanian shops that sell Lithuanian goods. Uh, they have a very well organized society where they meet and share uh, cultural things from their homeland. They think that they think is valuable to bring with them. They, uh, you find them as engineers, doctors, nurses, also car drivers and painters, but you find them in all parts of the society. A few tips to take with you. Norwegian culture have the latest year developed into where we have a flat and equality based structure in the companies. Managers are not supposed to manage so much, much uh, more act as coaches and facilitate that work can take place. Focus on cooperation, which has been mentioned a couple of times. Cooperate will get you much further than simply deliver something. Cooperation is wanted. We have informal and quick communication and trust among people. Appear trustworthy, uh, be reliable, have transparency. That will open many doors for you. And to the last punctuality and balance and work in private life, it's also something that we had room for. Um, respect these simple rules and they will open the doors and welcome and be your partner for many years to come. Thank you. Stein. Thank you very much. That was some uh, interesting perspectives. We have um, uh, a question here that I'd like to, to share with you. Um, what could be the best practice for a Lithuanian company looking for B2B partnerships in Norway to open a legal entity or to start working without it? Was that for me? For any of you, what would you uh, recommend in that respect? But Tor, you're in a good position to answer it, I think. Yes. Um... In the consulate, we've had uh, many visitors, uh, many companies coming here, and we have um, made arrangements for many companies to 
to visit interesting prospective clients. It's, I would say my advice would be to find a local partner, a partner that is anchored in the system and can open doors for new business ventures. And also respect the earlier advice, think long-term. You can't do it in a week's visit. Also, I would say, uh, create contacts in these um, energy uh, uh, exhibitions that we have, or two or three of them, where there is a fantastic, fantastic arena to create good contacts. I think that echoes also what Perry Morton and Espen said. Uh, do you want to add anything to that, any of you? I think I uh, mentioned it uh, very well. Uh, yeah, I, think I agree with Tor on this one. And, and uh, Espen, do you see that there is a huge advantage? Uh, and, and I think Kongsberg Group especially is focused on this. You mentioned why you had selected Bulgaria, that being in Europe is a real key asset uh, for Norwegian companies. Yeah, for Kongsberg, it's important that uh, we deal with uh, what's called friends of Norway, um, even yeah, Nordics or, uh, or countries being in the European Union. And uh, that's a real benefit. Um, uh, it's maybe not a showstopper not to be there, but there may also be it not to be part of that. Um, and uh, it's working well with India. A lot of good uh, huge companies are working with, with India, but it's uh, kind of easier to work with European nations. And uh, we also see some sign in India, which is probably not going always in the right direction. Mm. Uh, when you think about, about the governments and, and how they focus on uh, more national interests and so on. So yes, absolutely. That brings me actually to the last question I have, and that is how important is trust and what is the catalyst to generate the trust between companies and individuals in these two countries? Uh, I can answer. Or start. Yes, please. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Well, I, I think uh, trust is so important and you gain trust if you get results together, I would say. So kind of uh, making some uh, initial uh, wins. Um, see that they're working, the culture are, your working culture is good. Uh, you understand each other. You have mutual respect, extremely important, really mutual, mutual respect, I would say. Uh, involvement, good communication and also uh, managing the expectation from both parties, I would say. Very good, thank you. And then one last question to the ambassador. Uh, you have worked in uh, many corners of the world and established uh, partnerships and the relationships uh, in, in uh, uh, several continents. Um, how significant do you feel that the collaboration between specifically the two countries of Norway and Lithuania is, and uh, is it uh, along with the other relationships Lithuania have, or, or, or is it more important than the average? You, you need to unmute, we can't hear you. For some reason, we don't hear you. A little bit of, of technical help. Um, while we're waiting for, for that, maybe um, uh, one more question. Our IT developers are not eager to move permanently in recent years. How is Norwegian companies per perceive remote work? Any changes before and after pandemics? Anyone wants to comment on that? I can comment on that. Um, we have outplaced people in on some of the larger corporations here in Stavanger. Uh, they all practice home office fairly strictly. 
and uh, when I talk to them, they see no loss in productivity. In Christ, many of them see an increased productivity if they are very clear on setting what is expected and time limits. So I don't think this is going to go away, but it is a little bit depending on what type of business and what sort of environment. Very good. I can uh, I can add on that one as well. Um, in the IT world, I mean, the, the distance is not that important. And in, in COVID times, when everyone is working from home, uh, you are expected to deliver remotely. So, so the communication was quite good. And no one actually missed that, uh, that communication, that live uh, communication. And, and at some, and sometimes you, you actually save a lot of time pendling from home to work, from work to home in, in, in the rush hours. And that just give, uh, give more uh, productivity. You spend more time with the family and, and me too, uh, just as Tour said, uh, uh, I experienced that no productivity has been lost, maybe in the first few months, but, uh, but then after that, uh, life, business is normal. And, and I hear that uh, some customers of Bouvier actually enforcing the rule of 50-50 working from home and office, like two days a, a week uh, from the office and then the rest of three days uh, from the from the home and uh, switching uh, the next week. So yeah, indeed, this is a trend in the in this um, uh, industry. Good, thank you, Kestutis. Can we see if we can hear the ambassador now? Yes, uh, I changed my place. I changed my location. So so I, do you hear me now? Now we hear you oh, very yeah. well. Okay, so the peculiarities of Norway in our relations. Uh, uh, I don't know, I'm still trying to solve the riddle why Norway became a home for so many thousands of Lithuanians. Why? But still, it, it is a fact. It is a fact. We are number two as national minority after after Poles in Norway. Yes, and this is the fact, and this will be a fact when thousands of Lithuanians will establish themselves. They will be in Norway. They they not many of them will return. I think. Uh, to Lithuania, and they will be a factor in Norwegian society, I think. They'll start to participate in the activities of the communities they live in, and I think Lithuania has a very good uh, pr perspective for future relations and uh, with, with, with the Norway. And, uh, okay, and this is still uh, Norway is very important for us, uh, bringing the culture of uh, doing business to Lithuania, because it's a good example how you do, how you trust the uh, law, because in still we are in Lithuania, still we are somehow affected by our past and by our culture of doing business at that time and not trusting, not to anyone or not to trusting the law, yes, or trying to, 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 to escape the law. Yes, and this is the, in Norway, I think we, 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 we get a new uh, modern culture of relations, and this is very, very important for us. So both ways, I think we provide a lot of, of uh, workers, a lot of engineers, a lot of uh, professionals to your society, but also you, you provide some kind of, of culture for us and then still uh, we see a lot of uh, lot of uh, opportunities in, for future good thank you very much i think Tour has a comment to that yes i have uh, just as an example for showing you how productive innovative and forward leaning they are uh, the latest was can you see this one of the local Siberia. guys wrote a book after a fantastic trip to Russia, to Lake Baikal. Very nice, very nice. We're working on if we can translate this into Norwegian and English. And we've come a long way. There are uh, three or four shops the last year that has been open in Stavanger. Uh, one producing ice cream, uh, homemade, fantastic Italian gelato. Um, 
they have been able to get an appointment with the local largest uh, food chain. So we will be in their stores. Uh, we have one opening a clothes store. They are surviving despite uh, the COVID. And there are numerous, if I say more than 20 companies working on painting, transportation, renovation. Uh, there was one uh, selling and just opening a fantastic place for selling uh, architectural high quality uh, things for your home. Uh, Ake, Mahogany, etc., etc. They are doing well. And I think uh, Jonas Paslaukas have a point. Some of them will not go home, but they will never leave Lithuania. It's there in their heart. They visit it every year. And um, we will both reward from this. They bring some to us, and some of that they bring home. Thank you. Thank you. So they will uh, never leave Norway and they will never leave Lithuania because it's both in their hearts. Uh, I think Stutis has a couple of comments and then there is one more question before we wrap it up. Yeah, thanks for the time. Um, I just uh, want to touch up again on uh, what Thur uh, said earlier about uh, the, 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 the flat structure uh, of the management and then managers being as the coaches. Um, I do have I have experienced that in my in those ten years in Norway uh, myself. I mean, one example was that uh, uh, we we were having a, a a buffet or or the the celebration of one event, and amazing thing happened that uh, uh, the bosses actually started serving the food for the for the employees and the guests in that event, and uh, that was something shocking to me. Uh, like you being served by your boss and the boss of his boss. Uh, and you're being poured the wine, so so they are not. Uh, they're more like uh, friends and coaches, and they're not like the ones who are always constantly pushing, deliver that, deliver that, deliver that, um, and then uh, just continue on that delivering part. Um, uh, I was at the customer in my four years, in my first four years, uh, and I had a chat with him, uh, saying, "So what's what's happening? Why aren't you interesting? How we are delivering?" And said, "Yeah, I understand you. Uh, we all of us are." At, adults so i don't need to stand behind the back and i don't hear i don't need to hire managers who's standing behind behind the back to know that you are delivering we trust you so that was also very important and very kind of mind-changing good that's interesting uh, i i have one more question that i maybe want two answers to and uh, it's about the, what the areas it is best for a common Lit Lithuanian Norwegian IT company to be seen in, you know, if you within uh, public procurement, maybe Alexander can answer that. You mentioned some web places, but where would you physically meet and actually get to know the people and uh, get a relationship and a network of people that you could do business with? Are there any marketplace for public procurement that you could um, meet face-to-face -face people? Well, uh, the answer is uh, not not face-to-face -face, uh, in this time, I guess, but it's uh, <clears throat> the, the public procurement areas to uh, or arenas to look for. It's, uh, it's called Doffin, D-O-F-F-I-N, which is the Norwegian um, uh, portal where all the uh, tenders are published. Uh, so that's uh, one thing you can look at. Also, uh, we have a cooperation with Mercel, which is the um, leading Norwegian company in um, tender uh, systems uh, and they also have an um, uh, affiliate in, uh, in Lithuania. Uh, just had a presentation for them uh, two weeks ago. So you can also use Mercel, it's M-E-R-C-E-L-L. -L. I think we can maybe share that later on as well. And that's where you can find the tenders, but it's not a physical or, uh, or a meeting place. I think it's uh, more organizations like um, ICT Norway, uh, where we are a member of as well. Uh, I, I think uh, if Morten doesn't uh, contradict me, it's open for uh, foreign companies as well, if they want to, as a member. And that's where you can join uh, seminars, webinars, and then uh, after COVID, probably also um, live meetings to, to get information. Very good. Then, uh, Per Morten, you mentioned uh, on the same question that uh, maybe incubation, uh, you know, companies uh, were the right place to start to create your relationships. 
Yeah, I think that could be um, uh, a good idea, uh, at least if you are um, uh, as a small, uh, or, or let's say a smaller company who don't want to uh, to uh, go for the, the big tenders or have the possibility to go for, uh, for, for the big tenders. But um, uh, concerning incubators, uh, there are now a lot of successful uh, incubators and uh, when the COVID situation is um, normalizing, hopefully uh, during some uh, months, uh, I think uh, perhaps that uh, a visit uh, to this or uh, perhaps already now to start uh, to, um, to have some contacts uh, with incubators. There is, so there's a lot of young people uh, who have uh, brilliant uh, ideas, they have set up uh, small companies, but they do not have the, enough manpower to, uh, to do it. And then uh, corporation and offshoring could be uh, actually a, um, a, a very good possibility. So uh, that could be one of my um, advices for, for, for smaller, uh, younger company also in Lithuania. Very good. Then I think we have stopped the questions. Then I would again uh, say thank you to Enterprise Lithuania and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs represented by the Lithuanian Embassy in Oslo and also to NLCC and LNCC for having put on this uh, webinar. I hope you have all enjoyed it. Darius, do you want to have a finishing remark? We can't hear you. You're muted. I just uh, would like to thank all the contributors, of course, and uh, all the participants for making the speeches uh, and uh, at the end to encourage all the Lithuanian companies to stay, to be more active, uh, contact us, embassy and, uh, and our partners, and we'll try to, to, to be, our, how to say, the, the gates to, to, to the wider network of, uh, of our um, uh, partners, to our diaspora and all, all the rest. So let's start with that. Thank you. Good. Then speakers stay on and then thank you everyone for having participated today.